Uh, the long story of how I came to do what I'm doing is that in 2002, I was in my senior year of college, and I was working as a poetry major, so I was uh, interested in becoming a poet, and I was in a, a workshop of people that are all poetry majors, and I went to make a point uh, about a poem, and in order to make a point, I referenced another poem. We were workshopping a poem, and in a room full of poetry majors, almost no one had actually read the poem that I referenced, and so as I was walking down the stairs after the class that day, I sort of had this epiphany. I was like, if in a room full of poetry majors, no one had read the poem, and the way I had ended up making the point in my, in my, in my discussion of that, that poem was by actually referencing a film. So I was like, here I am in a room full of poetry majors, and I'm making, in order to make a point about a poem, I had to reference a film. And so my thought was, if I really want to express myself creatively, I'm going to have to change mediums because it's very difficult to get people to read poetry and to have social conversations about them. I would give books of poetry that I'd written to friends and you know, a couple of weeks later be like, what did you think? And I could see in their eyes that they hadn't <laughs> been able to read it. So I decided that I would take a course in documentary filmmaking and at, right after graduating from the University of Colorado, I signed up for a five-week crash course in documentary filmmaking uh, in New York, in New York City. And I had sort of thought that it was going to be that, <laughs> you know, 22 and not a super realistic person anyways. I thought I would learn how to become a filmmaker in five weeks and then I was going to move to Spain and be a filmmaker, you know, in quotes. And like, I really like the idea of sleeping after I ate lunch. Uh, the uh, siesta and so so anyways I about two weeks into the five-week boot camp I realized that it was gonna take me many years to become a filmmaker and that that wasn't even a sure thing so I I after I completed the five-week course I threw myself into every different type of production job I was shooting editing producing on a number of different projects in New York and then in the summer of 2006, that was really a transformative summer for me. Uh, I was hired by A and E uh, to be a, a field producer and and a cinematographer for a documentary series called The First 48. And for those of you that aren't familiar with The First 48, basically The First 48 is a documentary series that follows homicide investigations. Uh, in, in various cities across America. And the name, the reason why it's called the first 48 is because if the police don't get a lead in the first 48 hours following a homicide, their, their chances of becoming successful in finding the perpetrator seriously declines after those first 48 hours. And so it was a very depressing summer uh, I had a cell phone on me and every time that someone got killed in the city of Detroit, I would get a phone call, I would put on a bullet resistant vest and drive to the scene. Usually it was about two or three in the morning in, in the most dangerous neighborhoods in Detroit. Um, and then we would film straight for days without sleeping as, as they followed the investigations and through man hunts. And during the course of that summer, there were 60 homicides in the city of Detroit, which was actually more than there were in the city of Miami that year. And so I, you know, I was very, you get very focused in those situations. You also start to look at what it is you're doing with your life and why it is you're doing what you're doing with your life. And in one of our few days off, I think we had just finished where they had caught one of the perpetrators in, in a homicide you know, we had a couple days off, I actually went to this film called An Inconvenient Truth, uh, which I'm sure a number of the viewers have seen, that you've seen. Uh, and so I went to that film, and it was laid out in a very logical way to me that, that we're facing some challenges on our earth. And throughout the first half of the film, I was like, just tell me what to do. You know, I will do whatever it takes to help reverse some of these these challenges that our Earth faces. And then the second half of the film, 
just like the first half, did a wonderful job of explaining all the problems that we faced, but really never provided any solutions. And so after some ruminations that summer in the summer of 2006, I had also started reading this book called The Omnivore's Dilemma, and I decided, you know what? Instead of turning my camera just on whoever hires me, and in this case, obviously turning, turning the lens that I was using to record things for my job, instead of turning the lens on sort of the worst of what mankind is capable of through the homicides, I started a company called Leave It Better. And Leave It Better, Leave It Better's entire purpose is to provide tangible environmental solutions. And so as I was reading this book through video and through, through community action, and we have a website, leaveitbetter.com, where you can see some of the things that we've done. Um, and so I was reading this book, The Omnivore's Dilemma, and as a journalist, I'm always looking for people that are passionate and charismatic about topics, things that, things that are really important to them. And so Joel Salatin was jumping off the page uh, with charisma. And I sent Joel an email and I said, we'd love to come to your, your film and farm. And actually the first film that I was going to do was a film called Green Pioneers. And I had reached out to pioneers in a number of different areas in the green movement. And one of them was Joel Salatin in agriculture. There's this wonderful electronics recycler, James Burgett in uh, San Francisco area. Uh, who has a wonderful story of, of transformation. Uh, there was a couple in Toronto that had created zero waste for an entire uh, month. Uh, there was green business, uh, green building. So I, I had chosen all these leaders in these various areas and was going to do segments on them and put that together as a documentary. And so I started doing that. I went to all these places and filmed with all these people. But Joel was just there was some vitality, and there's a vitality about all of them. I also, one of the reasons I realized that there wasn't, it wouldn't be fair to do a film called Green Pioneers because each of these people needed a, their own film to sort of address the topics that were being uh, discussed. And the topic that was the most vital and the most sort of jumping off of the screen with, with interest was definitely the time that I'd spent at, at, at Joel Salatin's farm. And so, what happened was, I sent Joel this email in 2006. He said yes. I went down to the farm, and the original concept was that it was going to be a film where we didn't use any narration, and we were just going to we were just going to uh, use the the structure of the seasons and the interactions between Joel and his family and the animals and the landscape and the environment, and so we did that. Uh, and then Joel had been talking a lot about conventional agriculture, and so when we started editing the film in 2008, after we'd spent a year filming in 2007, uh, we, we didn't have any footage from the conventional side of things. And so we sent out and we got some stock footage from PETA uh, that was basically showing the conventional side of things, but through hidden cameras. And as a journalist, it didn't feel right, so I decided we weren't going to use any footage from PETA, any hidden camera footage in the film. And I spent the next couple of years, 2009, 2010, going and filming at conventional chicken farms and hog farms and cattle feed yards, and realized that it was much more complicated than good and evil, and that there was a lot of farmers that were forced into conventional agriculture because they didn't have a way to have a market. And then we realized that there's this incredibly exciting movement of farmers selling directly to their customers. And so that's a way that farmers can get more of a food dollar. And after about four and a half years of filming, we edited together and finished the documentary American Meat, which is the first documentary from Leave It Better. Uh, and so I guess that would be the answer to, to how I got to be where I'm doing today. Do you think now, these many years after 2002, later, that you were right about video <laughs> reaching people in ways that poetry didn't? Yeah, it's funny. I, I, I've actually joked in my head to myself that, uh, you know, I left poetry because no one reads poetry. And 
now I'm in documentary filmmaking and no one watches documentary films. But but I actually, you know what, I do I do think that people are watching more documentary films and I do think that, you know, I feel like video literacy is actually going to be one of the big changes in the way that our culture communicates because right now, you know, if, you, if you're going to school as a first through eighth grader, you learn how to write, you learn the basics of mathematics and of science, but you don't learn the, the basics of video storytelling. And I think that'll change because more and more in our culture, it's a lot easier to just pull out your phone and, and take a photograph or, or use the video function of your phone to communicate with somebody else. And it's gonna be just as important that, it's gonna be just, it is today just as important that you're able to communicate with video as it is to be able to communicate and write paragraphs with proper grammar. And so the other really exciting thing is that for the first time in film history, it's getting to the point where you can get an incredible camera for a few hundred dollars, you can get a laptop that has editing software that's absolutely the most professional editing software you can have, and for a pretty small startup cost of a couple thousand dollars that you could probably get through loans if you didn't have the ability to save up for that type of money, you can actually get an idea and make a movie. And it's just like when you have the printing press, you get an idea, you write a book. It's getting to be that same way. So there's, there is, I think, I think it's an incredibly exciting time to be doing documentary films and to be communicating through video with people, especially when you have something like the food movement where there's this incredible grassroots infrastructure in place with co-ops and with uh, various farms and various uh, companies that are really interested in this and they have all this infrastructure and you can actually create a film for a low cost, you can really get a message to a group of people that want to hear that message in a way that hasn't been possible before. So who do you want to communicate with and what do you want to do to them? Well, the biggest target audience for our documentary is is young farmers and people that are interested in people uh, the people that are interested in farming and people. So one of the things that's been wonderful is that we we've been able to do a number of screens for FFA chapters all throughout the state of Iowa. And FFA, for those of you that aren't aware, is an acronym that stands for Future Farmers of America, and basically. It's, a, it's an organization that is dedicated to celebrating the work that farmers do. And there's over 500,000 young American people in that organization. And so I'd like to reach everyone. I'd like to reach the general audience. I feel like there's a, there's a great value in people seeing what the work and the challenges and the joys that farmers share every day and go through every day. That's a great value. But from a very pragmatic standpoint, the people that I want to see the film more than anyone are young people that are growing up on a farm or interested in agriculture. Because a lot of times they aren't aware of these alternative agricultural methods and they can actually get into farming without as much upfront cost as the conventional ways. Uh, and so because our film doesn't alienate one side or the other side, we were able to reach those young farmers and I think have an impact. Uh, like one of the great things that just happened is the state of Iowa just purchased uh, our documentary for all of their ag ed programs in the state. And the reason for that is because our film is a good educational tool to discuss different types of agriculture. And, and, and I hope to reach FFA chapters all around the country. So when did that audience idea dawn on? Well, uh, with this whole new grassroots distribution that's happening with documentary, they say that you often don't know who the audience is for your film until you go out and you screen it. And so, I, it's sort of like throwing spaghetti against the wall. You know, we, we although I guess <laughs> there's a little bit more logic to it. Uh, you know, we, the, the typical path with documentary distribution is that you, apply to Sundance, you apply to Toronto, you apply to the major film festivals, you cross your fingers or you know someone, and then if you get in, then you hope there's a bidding war for different uh, you know, distribution companies, and then you have a premiere in New York or Los Angeles, and then if it does well there, it'll reach more markets, and then you go into DVD sales, 
and there's not much of a direct interaction with your audience. And when we finished our film, we said, you know what, we don't care what the people at the festivals think of our film, it doesn't really matter. What we care about, who, who, we, what we care about is what the farmers think about our film. And so we took our film to field day at Polyface Farms in Virginia, and we had 1,500 farm families there. We did four screenings over the course of two days, and we had a wonderful launch to our film at the very epicenter of this alternative agriculture in our country. And from there, we actually had a number of people that said, oh, we'd like to host the screen in North, we'd like to host the screen in North Carolina, we'd like to host the screen in Iowa, we'd like to host the screen, because people come from all over the country to this place. And then we went to Iowa, and we did screenings all throughout the state of Iowa, screenings where we have food together before the film, we have the screening of the film, and then we have a conversation with farmers in that region about the issues that the film brings up. And so we were in Iowa, and I had a sort of one of those transformative moments where I went to the Iowa State Fair, and I had these big dreams of just setting up my laptop and some speakers and playing the film for the the audience at the Iowa State Fair without you know any permits or any you know sort of under the radar, and it was a massive failure. I mean, I I I, I screened the film like a couple of people people just streamed by our booth, but you know, basically no one stopped. And I was just like, oh my gosh, I wasted $10 on parking and, you know, a couple of days of my life. And then Donna, who was kind enough to allow, allow me to, to sort of borrow her booth, which was through the organ one of the organ wonderful organic organizations in our country, whose acronym I can never remember, um, that Donna said, well, you know what, maybe you should just go out and talk to people instead of having, you know, trying to play the film so people can watch it when they're really just interested in getting fried butter or whatever it is. And so, you know, we went, I, I, I left the, the laptop and I walked around the Ag Hall in, in, in Des Moines and I happened to go to the FFA booth and it happened to be that the state advisor, which is the person that's pretty much running FFA for the state, was the one at the booth at that time, Dale Groose. And I said to Dale, uh, well, first I waited for about 10 minutes as he was talking to someone else, uh, and then I said to Dale, you know, we're having a screening tonight in Des Moines at the Fleur Theater, and I'd like you to come. And he was very skeptical. He said, you know, is this a PETA movie? And I was like, no, it's not. It's, it's just a dialogue about agriculture. And he was like, how do I know? And then I told him who some of the panelists were, and Rich Degner, who's the executive director of the Iowa Pork Producers Association, and Chuck Wirtz, who's, an, who's a commodity hog farmer who's in the film, they were both on the panel that night, and he knew Rich, and he said, oh, if Rich is on the panel, I know this is not a film that is gonna be alienating uh, conventional agriculture. So Dale brought three FFA state officers, and the way that FFA works is you actually have high school students in leadership positions, and so three, Michael Martison was one of them, Lindsay Calvert was another, and I believe uh, the third, was uh, Patrick Diedrich. I, I now know them all personally. They four came to the Fleur Cinema in their FFA uniforms and they watched the film. And Dale was just, he sent me, or I forget if he called me or sent me an email, but he just said, we were in the parking lot for 45 minutes after we watched that film talking. They were so excited. And these, these are young people, young farmers, and they were just, thrilled about the film and Dale said we want to get this film to our FFA chapters and so I said all right and, and I think that was sort of a moment when I realized who our audience is you know I didn't really know who our audience was I just thought it was people that ate or something like that and, and people that eat are part of our audience but I think our core audience the people that need to see our film are young people specifically young people that are considering a career in agriculture because our film can show you in a balanced way some of the advantages and disadvantages of the different types of production that you'll go into. So by deciding to have a certain sort of integrity in your treatment of conventional agriculture, you lucked in to an audience that was plausible and receptive right. and just the right sort 
for your overarching political objective, which is to make some kind of change in how agriculture works. Yes, I mean, from day one, well, not well, not from day one. It, it was it was basically once I spent time on the farm with conventional farmers like Johnny Glosson and Sam Talley and Chuck Wirtz that are in our film. Once I spent personal time with those people and I realized how good that those people are and their families are, then I realized that I wasn't going to do anything that would make them upset when they watched the film or say anything. I wanted to I wanted to show the challenges that they face and really see it from their perspective. I mean, if you've had a family farm for a hundred years and suddenly all of your customers go to the grocery store instead of buying it from you directly, you don't have a choice. You either have to get out of it or you have to sign a contract with the big integrator. There is no other choice. And so, especially back in the 80s, now there is actually another choice. But, you know, these farmers that are raising most of the meat that Americans eat, they're actually, they got, a lot of them got into this situation without much of a choice. They either were, had to either get out of agriculture and stop raising food, or they had to sign a contract. And so our film focuses on the farmers, and focuses on the farmers and, and showing people the challenges that they face, and then promotes a system that allows farmers to get a, more money of, of the food dollars that we all spend. One thing that keeps coming up in, in your film uh, is uh, the desire of farmers to pass it on. I imagine you've heard that a lot. They want to have, they want the next generation to yeah. have something. And I expect a lot of the developments in agriculture make that feel very doubtful. I'm wondering what kind of conversations you had about how agriculture could be carried on to the next generation as you got to know these people. Yeah, uh, it's such an issue. I, almost every farmer that, I, that I've talked to, like the generational transfer of their farm is just central to their, to their existence, really. Uh, because you've been working your whole life to keep this farm going. Your mother and father kept the farm going. Their mother and father kept the farm going. And so how are you going to keep the farm going? And the problem with conventional agriculture, and it's actually the great strength of conventional agriculture as well, is its incredible efficiency. And so Chuck Wirtz would talk about how when he was a little boy, they would have two or three row cultivators. And for those of you that aren't aware of agriculture, what a cultivator is is something that essentially helps to dig, make sure that the weeds don't grow up. They would have two to three row cultivators, so they would they would have to go with this machine up and down two or three rows of corn or soybeans or whatever it is they were cultivating, wheat. Uh, and so now, a couple years ago, there was a 24 row cultivator. And so you can imagine that if you have a machine that can then do 12 times the amount of work that a machine when Chuck was a little boy, it's gotten that efficient, you're gonna have 12 times less people you're going to have 12 times less schools, you're going to have 12 times less, gro less grocery stores, 12 times less hardware stores, 12 times less small towns in our country. And so the problem with conventional agriculture is its great strength, which is that it's incredibly efficient and incredibly technologically advanced. So what's the solution? Well, what a lot of farmers are doing is they're actually getting into organic production because it's more labor intensive and that will create jobs for the next generation for their kids. Not because of some ethical reasons uh, or anything like that. It's very pragmatic. It's more labor intensive, you have more of a premium, you get more money, so you'll be able to create jobs. And so a lot of farmers are finding if they want to make a successful generational transfer, especially if they have more than one kid, because that's another issue. If you have five kids in a conventional farming system, you need five times the land <laughs> that you have currently because it won't work. If you, if, now, if you switch to an organic production model, like you have at Polyphase or any of the other wonderful farms that are doing that, you suddenly have a lot more work that needs to be done. And the other thing, Purdue, for instance, when you go to the grocery store and you buy a Purdue chicken breast, that farmer will get eight cents of the dollar 
that that you spend. So that chicken breast is five dollars. They'll get forty cents of that, right? Or I don't know if my math is right, but anyways, they're getting eight percent of that food dollar. And so when you have when you have that type of a situation, the reason why farmers get such a small percentage of it, it makes sense because Purdue provides all the chicks. They just drop them off. Then Purdue has a truck that takes them to the slaughterhouse, which is Purdue Slaughterhouse, which then takes it to a packaging facility, which is Purdue's packaging facility. They have a wonderful marketing team that lets you know about all the different things that Purdue's doing. And then they have distribution relationships at grocery stores. So they're doing most of the work, which is why the farmers only get you know that percentage of it. The farmers have to take out the loans and they have to deal with all the environmental uh, regulations that come up. So the farmers are getting squeezed but the cool thing about this new new agriculture that's that's showing up is that the farmers get 100% of the dollar. And the reason why they get 100% of the dollar is because they suddenly do everything on that line of things. They have to do the transportation. They have to find a way to get it to the slaughterhouse. They have to do the marketing. And so the bad news and the good news in that model is that it needs more people. And so often you'll find that you have a, a farmer who doesn't like talking to people, but you have a gregarious outgoing wife who wants to do the marketing. And so, you know, so then you'll create jobs that along that different line. So you have kids that are into marketing or technology, they can do the website. You have kids that are interested in not not interested in talking to people, they can do the raising of the of the vegetables or the animals. And so if you become that entire vertically integrated thing as your own farm and as your own brand, you create a lot more work and you actually get to keep the whole dollar. So it creates jobs for these small family farms in a way that the industrial side doesn't. In your experience looking at farm families and uh, uh, this, the next generation, is organic production of the kind you just described making it interesting enough to hold the next generation given the cultural influences that people people are running into just growing up in the 21st century. Yeah, I mean that's a that's a huge challenge. I mean, a lot of times kids just want to play video games or uh, you know have a job where they don't have to they don't have to do a lot of demanding physical labor. Um, although I feel like there is a shift happening on that level. Uh, you know, the enrollment for agriculture at Iowa State University is higher than it's ever been. Uh, FFA is the largest youth organization in the country. You also see so many gardening programs and things propping up all over the country. Uh, and I feel like people are very interested in their food, where it comes from. And a lot of people are interested in growing some of it, like maybe just having a tomato plant in the backyard or having something on their balcony. Uh, so you're right. It's it's going to be a challenge because I don't think it's been a it's been a while since there've been generations that worked as hard and, and are used to the farm life. Uh, but with that said, there are a lot of young people that don't have jobs right now that have able bodies and minds and would like to do something that matters. And so hopefully we can take the fact that you have the worst job prospects coming out of college in many generations and you have this very rapidly growing market for organically produced and, and grass-based grass foods, and you can take that square peg and you can put that into the square hole, and you can say, all right, let's, have, let's create jobs for young people that are interested in, in working and doing something rewarding, uh, and let's, let's help heal our, our country's agriculture. Um, I mean, I grew up on uh, the sort of farm, in some ways it's your ideal, okay? I mean, they bought little tractors when we went off to college. Before that, it was pretty much hoes. Uh, we were doing a lot of vegetables and selling them locally. Our own animals, and we invented animal pens. My father, who was possibly the worst carpenter in creation, was in charge of keeping animals in pens by, you know, hammering boards together and they kept getting out. And I mean, it was, it was a bizarre juggling act, but all of the stuff you're talking about was also true about it, you know. Uh, we were, uh, you know, 
we had all the pieces and we knew everything about the food and we knew the people who ate it and we knew their health situation. I mean, my mother could say exactly what good her vegetables were doing to the elderly alcoholic who came every, you know, every sure. week for vegetables. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, she could say, well, we've been kept keeping him alive for 10 years now. <laughs> uh, things like that. Um, so, so, you know, it's, it, the dream was there, and my parents knew it. They fortunately had another income. So, you know, they had a teaching income to supplement this, so they didn't have to make it on, on this little farm. They didn't have the marketing oper opportunities that you mentioned. Um, but when I, you know, I mean, one thing that kept me from thinking about farming was the lack of any sort of intellectual challenge at that point. Sure. Uh, it felt like drudgery. I couldn't see it as anything but drudgery sure. when I was 17 years old. Second thing was just physically, it was hard at a level I wasn't willing to take on. Sure. And third, and I don't know if I was as conscious of that then as I was a few years later, is it was dangerous. Uh -huh. I mean, farming, I think, ranks up there among the most dangerous professions on earth. <laughs> it's partly because farmers keep taking the guards off of anything that has a guard on it. Right. And, you know, skipping all sorts of little steps that might actually keep them safe. But nevertheless, you know, there's a lot of hernias. Sure. You know, there's a lot of, pe of people rupturing things, breaking things, just because of the, you know, you get loads that you're not prepared for. So I'm, I'm, I'm wondering about that third point. I mean, as in, you know, you've had now some years of watching farms. Uh, do you think things have gotten safer? Well, uh... I don't have a frame of reference with the way things used to be. Well, I guess that is a crazy question. Let me revise it. Is, do things, does, it look like, does it look like this is a relatively safe profession? <laughs> no, I don't think it does. Uh, I think that the people that farm, they have something in their blood that they can't do anything other than farm. And I, I, it's a very risky uh, thing to do. Uh, and I think that's one of the things we need to change in the way that we all think about food is that we need to stop putting all of the risk on our farmers and we need to have these models like CSAs where everyone pays the farmer up front and then that way if, the, if there's a hurricane or something and, and the farm gets wiped out, they're not the ones that, that suddenly have to question whether or not their family farm will be able to continue. Um, as far as like physical safety, you know, I, I think a lot of the, the farmers, just like anything else, after a number of years, you sort of know which pigs to stay away from. You know, you, you learn techniques and ways of, of doing things, but there is an element of risk and an element of, of unpredictability. And I think that's what's so appealing to the people that go into agriculture is that instead of being inside in front of a computer where you know you may be doing things that don't seem to be having a, an obvious impact on anything else you, you're involved in in life in a very vital way where you know you are outside and what you decide to do will directly impact you know the land and yourself and and that's an exciting thing um, but yeah, as far as safety, uh, I don't think it is, I, th I don't think it is or maybe ever will be a very safe profession. Yeah, yeah. And, and, but you mentioned that you, you go along, the, the, you know, there's a romance to farming yeah. that farm kids get, but it's hard to pass on to non-farm kids, you know. <laughs> sure. Uh, and I mean, maybe, maybe your, your movie has some hope of, of, a, of arousing that in people. I guess I, are, are you, are you by, by background a farm kid? I'm not, I'm not. I grew up in, uh, in, subur in the suburbs. Uh, I uh, did, one of my friends started a farm out in 
Long Island uh, in the early 2000s and I went out and uh, worked on his farm for a weekend and then really enjoyed the experience and then he hired me to work on his farm for a couple week uh, for every weekend during a couple of summers it was the summer of uh, 2007 and 2008 and uh, it was just a wonderful experience I, you know being out, being outside working with my hands you know actually using my body to do something uh, was was something I really enjoyed uh, and you know there were moments where I realized just how little I knew or was connected to food you know like there were we went outside and I remember we were harvesting pitch, potatoes with a pitchfork and like I didn't realize the potatoes grew underground you know, I was, I like, I pulled it out and I was shaking it out and I was just like, whoa, you know, I it just, I just didn't know that. And, and, and maybe I had been told it or something, but it didn't really resonate because I'd never actually seen a potato be pulled out of the earth and see the dirt come off of it. And so I think that in our culture, a lot of people feel disconnected from everything. They feel disconnected from their food. They feel disconnected from their clothes. They feel disconnected from their furniture. They feel disconnected from their homes. They don't really understand where anything comes from or how it's made. And so I think part of the reason why you have this resurgence in this local agriculture and why so many people are deciding to take a portion of land that they have access to and put some seeds in it is because we're all hungry for connection. We're all hungry to connect to something and to know the story behind something because we don't know this, the story behind anything in our lives. And so food is probably the easiest way to do that in a, in a simple way. It's amazing if you go outside and you take a seed, a lettuce seed, and you drop it in the ground, it'll grow in six weeks and you'll have lettuce. And it works every time, or almost every time. So, you know, I mean, it, it's something where you can actually understand something about your life and where it comes from. And that's an exciting thing. I'm struck in your story of a documentary by just how long you were able to spend with these people. And I, it also sounds like this, the kind of success you had depended on what you learned by spending that long talking to uh, farmers, including farmers whose uh, ways of producing you might have initially found distasteful problematic. How did you manage to do it? Well, I think there's a number of different ways to make documentary films and one way is that you plan everything out before you make the film and then you sort of schedule like I'm going to be in Oskaloosa, Iowa from, you know, February 3rd to February 4th and the story that we're going to tell while we're there is the story of Steve Richardson who you know I did this research and I know he did this thing and you show up and it's pre-produced you get the stock footage you need to get and then you go that's one way of doing things and it's a very efficient way and there's a lot of positive ways to doing it that way the problem is that if you do something that way then you can't actually learn anything new because you just go there with a preconceived notion and if they don't fit into what you're trying to tell then you just don't use that footage or whatever and so the way that I approached this film was I went to those farms and I listened to them. And if they told me something that I didn't know, I would ask more about that. And, you know, that's why it took four and a half years to do the film because, you know, as I got out there, my perspectives changed so much in the making of the film. And so, you know, it's something where if you can, if you can do it that way, and there's a lot of disadvantages to doing things that way. I mean, it's very unorganized. You have a lot of footage. Uh, it's very difficult to edit it together into something that makes sense. You end up leaving out a lot of things that you're not sure what, at the time whether or not they'll be important. Um, but for me, it was, a, it was very important because I didn't understand the issues very well. And I felt like if I would have just gone out there and just shot for a day with Johnny Glosson, I would have never really gotten to know what the challenges that he faces are. I would have never really gotten to know who he was as a person. And so I decided to come down 
five or, you know, I don't know how many times I went down there, but I went down there a bunch and I spent a lot of time filming uh, with him and, and talking to him and his wife and his daughter and learning about the challenges that they really face. Were you self-financing the stuff? Uh, the money came from three places. Uh, one of it was from foundations, so we got support from the MacArthur Foundation, the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation, the Nathan Cummings Foundation. Uh, we got money from families that, private foundations of, through families that are passionate about these topics. And then I also accrued a decent chunk of credit card debt. So those were the three sort of funnels that went into the money pit. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I, I really want to get a picture of like, the kind of time you're spending. So how long on a visit would you be with a particular farmer? And you know, what kind of, what would the days be like? What's, what's the shooting like? Well, um, it was different with every place, but I mean, at Polyface, I would almost always stay with friends or family that lived nearby the farm. And so I would, I would show up like in Virginia, I stayed with my cousins and I would show up there and then I would go and film. And Joel is unbelievably transparent. I mean, he's just like, go wherever you want, film whatever you want uh, on the farm. He is very difficult to have much time with because he is so busy. So you're not able to just sort of interview him at length. Like most people will just, you, you know, you could just talk to them for as long as you want. But Joel, it's like, you need to have like, this is gonna be 30 minutes, you know and you know that it's only gonna be 30 minutes, and when that 30 minutes is done, you know, that's your window. So, but, but basically go down there, I would loosely have an idea of what we wanted to film. So with the conventional chicken farmers, I would go down there and film. I, w I filmed when they dropped off the baby chicks. Uh, I filmed when they were about three weeks old, and then I filmed when they were six weeks old, because I was just trying to show the sort of life cycle of the chickens. We didn't end up, we had, in an original rough cut, we actually showed the life cycles of all the animals, chickens, pigs, and hogs, and we took you from the hatchery all the way to the slaughterhouse. But then we realized that that wasn't what our film was about. Um, so, uh, yeah, so it would basically be going down to a place, showing up usually at dawn, because that's when you have the best light, uh, and also farmers are doing a lot of things at dawn, and then filming them as they're working. I, w I always told people when I was filming them that I didn't want them to say anything or tell me anything, just pretend like I'm not here. And so I would try to kind of disappear as I was filming them. And then I would ask them questions in a set up interview type of way. So that, that way, usually I would shoot before with them, then I would interview them on some of the curiosities that developed. And then Afterwards, after the interview, I would say, oh, he said that thing, so I need to get some, a shot that conveys that visually. So there was footage before the interview and after the interview that was footage of them sort of doing work and their, their sort of verite stuff, I guess. Um, and then the interview would drive sort of the, the discussion in that area. Uh, and they would often invite me to meals at their homes, so I'd often have meals at, at, with these farmers. Um, you know, wonderful conversations, uh, and yeah, uh, take the, we did a lot of tours, so they would sort of show me around before we started filming, and I would get a sense of what how the operation worked, things like that. My experience is that all the stuff I want to want is is in the conversations where I don't have a, where I don't have any recorder running. <laughs> yeah. run into that as a problem. Sure, I mean, there's always moments where you're like. <laughs> You, you ho someone says something when the camera's off and you're just like, wow, that's such an incredible thing. And then what I've always found, and it's this weird phenomenon, when you then set them up in an interview setting and you ask them the exact same question, they say 180 degrees from what they said every time. Like you never can recreate those things that people say because I don't know why, it's some weird phenomenon of the universe, but essentially they will not say what, whatever they said off camera, stays off camera. <laughs> now, never let anybody talk till you got the camera running, yeah. first rule. Yeah. Um, gee, well, what percentage of what you've shot is in, is in the movie? Would you uh, guess? Well, 
the thing was, about halfway through the film, we were shooting on tape, and at that point we had 120 hours of footage, and then the, the camera broke, and that was actually because we were shooting on farms and there was a lot of dust and things in the air, and so that our camera broke, and so we switched over to an HD camera that was tapeless that would do better in the farm situation. And so I don't have a way of quantifying the amount of hours of footage we shot tapeless. My guess is that it's in excess of 200 hours of footage. And, and so, uh, you know, we have, I would say it was probably uh, less than a percent of what we shot is in the actual film. So, do you have any thoughts about what to do with the other, what, 199 hours? <laughs> yeah, well, what stuff. we're going to do is we're actually, normally you would take some of the stuff and turn it into DVD extras or whatever. We decided not to do that. Uh, we decided that what we're going to do is we're going to take those incredible interviews that we had with people like Temple Grandin and, you know, uh, Bob Martin, Nicolette Hahn Nyman, Bill Nyman, a lot of farmers all over the country that we talked to that didn't make it into the film and we're gonna cut it into uh, we're gonna start with 50 hopefully we'll do more than that 50 two or three minute videos and we'll post them online and it'll be sort of this curated interactive experience that people can have with the footage because the last thing we want to do is to waste all of the energy and oil and time that we spent going out to California to film, even though nothing in the California trip except for like 10 seconds made it into the film. So, you know, we want to make sure that that people can, can effectively use that footage and have a conversation about some of the topics that it brings up relating to agriculture. Um, you keep using we. What's your team like and how do you work together? Yeah, well, it was a great team of people. Uh, it started off as an I uh, in the first year or so where I was doing everything, shooting, sound, producing. And then Memo Salazar came on uh, and Memo uh, was absolutely integral to the film. He's credited as the editor. He's credited as a writer, first credit on the writing, uh, also a producer. So Memo, a uh, huge, huge part of, of why the film was able to happen. Uh, and Memo, essentially, I would go out and shoot, and then Memo would be like, we don't have enough, we need more. <laughs> and I would go out and, you know, get more stuff, and then Memo would be like, we don't have enough, we need more. You know, and then at some point he was like, all right, we have everything we need. But so Memo was a, a hugely important part of the process. I mean, a lot of people were, but the sort of core people were myself, Memo Salazar, and then Ryan Nethery came on in 2010, and he was a, he's a cinematographer, and he shot probably about half of the footage that's in the film. Um, and so Ryan was on the road, and he was also instrumental in putting together the story of the film. So he was a producer and a cinematographer and credited for the story. Uh, and so Ryan, Memo, and myself really made the film happen. Uh, yeah. And, and how, when they came on, they, but how does a group like that come on? I mean, is it like the Brainerd Town Musicians, you know? I don't, what is that reference? Well, that's, oh, oh, you know, the story of all the animals who get kicked out of their families or ah. are about to get eaten, <laughs> sure. and they sort of find themselves together on the road, and it turns out they, 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 they although they're sort of useless where they are, they right, collect they coalesce, make something right, okay, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it was basically... You know, the food movement is, is, a, is a simple way to find people that are passionate about things. And so uh, Memo, I found, I put out a, a, a posting on Craigslist looking for producers. And then one of the producers like that almost came on, and I almost had no money to pay people. You know, I, I one of the producers that almost came on, I don't even remember her name because we didn't have any contact after that. She, she, she left because she got a paying gig. And, but she was like, oh, but you should talk to this guy, Memo. He's, you know, a great editor. And, and, and Memo's a professional editor for, like, Discovery. And, he, you know, he's a very talented guy that usually gets paid a lot of money. And so Memo is very passionate about the food movement. And so, you know, he saw the footage with Joel, and he got excited about it. I mean, I think he came on in, like, 2008, or maybe even earlier. He may have come on 
in the fall of 2007. He's, he's been on the project a very long time. And Memo, you know, sort of whenever he could, would work on the editing of the film. And I worked on the editing of the film. And then Ryan was an intern at our production company, Leave It Better, in the, in the spring of 2010. Ryan was an intern in the winter and spring of 2010. And he was just a very gifted uh, film student at NYU. And, you know, it, I started hiring him in the summer of 2010 after he had graduated to actually, you know, be a cinematographer. And so Ryan came from, you know, very, he's a young, very young guy coming from uh, academia, memo coming from the professional world. And then there was a lot of other people like Alejandro de Onis, was a, he's a producer on the film, Carly. Uh, they were people I met, uh, you know, through various ways, I mean, you know, circuitous ways that were passionate about food or passionate about film. Uh, that also really helped to shape the film. And there was a lot of stories of people, like the music was done by the Berkeley School of Music for free, you know, where these student, an entire class, Allison Plant at the Berkeley School of Music, Memo knew her and asked her to do the score with her class. And so she sort of oversaw the score while her students who were, you know, in their undergrad years composed this incredible score that didn't cost us anything and was truly remarkably done. So there was a lot of stories of like people sort of being incredibly generous and uh, you know helping us to make make the film come together. It was a big we. <laughs> um, I'm struck, you know, what changed your life, what, what got you out of crime reporting <laughs> was, uh, you know, two artifacts. An inconvenient truth and the omnivore's dilemma. Sure. And you have this hope that your work will deflect other people from their lives of crime reporting or <laughs> computer manipulating or cubicle sitting or whatever. Sure. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering, you know, reflecting back on what moved you, uh, what you've come to think about the direction of your work. I mean, are you going to do more inconvenient truth, <laughs> more uh, omnivore's dilemma, something quite different. Uh, how how would you think about uh, changing lives? Well, I think a lot of artists, especially in the document, and I, the, in the documentary film world, a lot of people are sort of like, you know, one year I'll do something on dancers, and the next year I'll do something on agriculture, and the next year, and it's sort of this wonderful way of creating different experiences for yourself as an artist and also learning a lot about different aspects of culture. I'm not taking that approach. So my next film, I'm going to focus on agriculture and I'm going to focus on environmental solutions. And so the next film I'm going to do is called Future Farmers for America. And so what we're going to do is we're going to tell stories about young people all across the country about the challenges that they face the joys that they share. How are we going to get young people into land that costs twenty thousand dollars an acre when they don't have any money? So we're going to focus. We've we've laid the groundwork with American Meat, and we've we've gained credibility with a lot of different agricultural organizations, and we're going to build on that foundation. And so my goal moving forward is to tell more and more stories through video about what people can do and what what our culture can do to have a positive impact on our environment. So it's sort of like you wouldn't be adverse to becoming the, the you know the central curriculum for future farmers of America. No, no, we would love to be uh, you know we would love to have our films endorsed by FFA and you know and I think that our films aren't even super artistic. You know, I think there's a, there's a level of it's almost like you know, a shovel, you might say a shovel is a, is a beautiful, has beautiful lines and you could see it as an artistic image, but a shovel actually can move dirt from one place to another. I think that our films are kind of like a shovel. Yes, a dirt moving production. Yes. The next, <laughs> the next name. <laughs> yeah, it's, I, I see it as a tool and a way of starting a discussion, not necessarily as sort of this free form artistic journey. So... What have you learned from American Meat 
that you think might carry over to the next one? Well, what is your sort of what are the sort of starting points for what I'm going to get to faster, or what I'm going to do more of, or what I'm not going to waste my time with? Sure. That kind of thought, which you have at the end of any project. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And I know Memo. I, Memo is has said he'll be on board for another film, but only if it doesn't take four and a half years. So, so I have to figure this out. And one of the things that, uh, that I'm absolutely focused on is, is figuring out land, the, one, of the, one of the central issues, because the film Future Farmers for America is gonna be all about the challenges that young people face. So land, the cost of land. That's going to be a huge issue that we're going to tackle in our film because a lot of times young people don't have any capital available. So how do you get around that issue? And we're going to look at some of the programs that are cropping up in our country to match young people with land that they can't afford but that they could start working on and maybe eventually own one day. Uh, so, so we'll look very t at a very targeted type of issue of what, what, what are the challenges that young people face. And then of course we'll, we'll, we'll have a lot of the, the sort of human side of things. So why did they decide to do this? You know, what is the thing that, that inspired them to do it? Is it because it's in the family for many years? Is it because they decided that they wanted to be outside working? You know, so, so, so we'll, we'll, we'll try, to, try to be as efficient as possible but also be able to discover things. It'll be a challenge. The other thing that's in our favor is that for two of those years, in 2007 and 2008, and actually some of 2009, I had to take on other jobs in order to pay the bills, uh, to, you know, like production jobs, shooting and editing. And so now we're getting to the point where I'm not having to do that. And so I can actually focus 100% of my time on you know, these issues relating to the documentary uh, and to agriculture. Um, do you think, uh, you know, do you think you can, I mean, I, I can imagine two focuses for what you're, you're doing. I'm wondering if you're, you, which, if you're thinking of both of them or one more than the other. One is, you got somebody who's already got the farming bug. They want to farm, but how is it possible? How do you get across these, these practical difficulties of finding land? finding capital, being able to borrow money, stuff like that. And there's this other thing we talked about, which is the romance of farming, that it's hard to catch outside of a farm. Are you, are, are you aiming for conveying the romance, or is it more a matter of talking about how those who already have the bug could get over the obstacles? I think it'll be... a a combination of both. I, I mean, we'll definitely, we'll definitely deal with practical issues like what, you know, how, how you, like, there's a program called Farm Beginnings, the Land Stewardship Project does, that you can, you know, approach and get land, or eFarmony at, at PASA that matches young people with land. You know, we'll look at tangible solutions that aren't talking about romance for people that already have the bug, but I'm also interested in those romantic stories because it, it is fascinating and I think people are interested in it even if they're not interested in farming themselves. They're interested in hearing about it and learning about it because there is something beautiful about being able to feed yourself and live from the land and that's something that people will always have a connection to regardless of you know whether or not they'll be doing that themselves. 